because I've been in recovery from addiction or substance use disorder, whatever you want to call it, for decades, I hear a lot of stories. And in this last week, I heard one this morning about a man whose son has been using fentanyl, which can be deadly, and um, wants to get off on his own, parentheses, does not work. And also someone very close to me announced that he's moved on from stealing his son's codeine to actually snorting heroin, also a recipe for death. In these days of an epidemic of opioid and benzodiazepine overdoses uh, leading to death, we need to know that there are countless examples of people who have recovered, who have come back, that there is a full life waiting for you on the other side, but it is not easy, uh, particularly in the beginning. Um, but there is a way, there is a path, and the amount of time you spend walking through hell is pretty short uh, compared to the miracle of life on the other side. Um, whether people find this, I don't know. But with a lot of us, it takes help from a rehab, a treatment center, a detox, some combination of those. Could be outpatient treatment, um, could be inpatient for a long period of time. But there is a full life waiting for you on the other side. And that is the message of today's guest. But sometimes the miracles are so much smaller than even someone, you know, j getting all the way sober. Sometimes the miracle is just that they picked up the phone to have a conversation with somebody. What is the sound of one man listening? This is Man Listening, a fresh podcast featuring the stories of strong women who bounce back. Man Listening, because every woman deserves to be heard. Hi, I'm Stuart Watson, and welcome to Man Listening. Amy, who also goes by Mimi to her kids, is a very dear friend. I, I've known her for years, and I saw her when she was in early recovery, and she was one of the most angry people you would ever come across. And uh, so that makes the miracle of her life nowadays all the more amazing. She so easily could have died along the way. And yet, today, she is a living and walking testimony to others. My friend, Amy. Where were you born? I was born in Statesboro, Georgia. Did you grow up in Statesboro? I did. Uh, we lived there for the first 14 years of my life. I've been to Statesboro. There's a college there. Yes, there is, George Southern University. That's right. That is where I went to college. There's a fair amount of partying that goes on at Georgia Southern. Yes, there is. Yeah, and now Statesboro, there are like these treatment centers around there. Yes, there are. <laughs> and my birth mother worked in one of them. Yes, and that is where I went to treatment. Willingway. Yes. Yeah which has since changed hands. It used to be family owned. Yeah, I was there uh, as a patient when it was family owned, thank God. Yeah, so for you, it was kind of like a homecoming. You were, it was, it was. <laughs> and, and how I ended up there was God, for sure. My husband, we, I had decided that I wanted to get help and we, he, because I wasn't doing much helping looking, I just wanted someone to take me somewhere and get me better. But we drove up to Virginia um, one night uh, to, to a treatment center up there, and he looked around, and it was like the middle of the night when we got there, and he said, <laughs> he came back out and he said, get in the fucking car, I'm not leaving you here. It looked a little bit like an insane asylum. Sketch, a little, a little sketch. sketchy. A little sketchy. And um, he actually uh, called my mom on the way home, I think I was passed out or something, but and my mom said, well, there's Willingway in Statesboro. Um, maybe you should try that. And so that's how I ended up there. Now, I know another guy who went to Willingway. And Willingway is, um, I've never been there. I've never met anybody there. But it strikes me as a no bullshit kind of a place. Yes. Like if you're going for like 
the hot stone massage. <laughs> yes, for yoga. It's not the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah if you're going for yoga on, on or equine therapy or any of that, that is not the place to go. The it, one kicker, the one kind of uh, draw in is that they, uh, you get your own room, which is unusual for treatment centers. Most of the time you get a roommate, but that particular place, um, they believe in you get your own room. So you can do your assignments and, and things like that. You have a little privacy. <clears throat> yeah. In the other places, it's more like you have a celly. <laughs> it's more like prison. Right. <laughs> and I'm sure they probably cut down on a lot of drama <laughs> by doing it that way. Yeah. Um, but I went down there with the in, with the, in my mind that I was going to have TV and room service. <laughs> what time is breakfast? Right, right. Where's my coffee? Yes, yes. I did bring my own sheets. Ah. I insisted. I remember talking to the woman on the phone and and I, I asked her if I could bring my own sheets and she said, honey, you can bring whatever you want. Now, she didn't tell me that I could bring whatever I want, but I might not be able to keep it all, but, but I was able to keep my own sheets. Could you have a stuffed animal if you wanted to? I would never have brought a stuffed animal, but I would imagine that they probably would have taken that away. Interesting. Yeah, they gave you two books, took away all your candy and books and- um, How about cigarettes? Oh yeah, you, can, you could smoke, thank yeah. God. Yeah. I know people who started smoking in treatment. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, thank God I was already smoking beforehand, but but they, you, when you get there, you have to, the detoxification is so um, intense that you have to have a tech walk you outside to smoke. I like they want to watch you? Watch you, keep, keep an eye on you. You know, you're on a lot of medications and um, make sure you don't fall, that kind of thing. Um, is it a suicide watch? No, not a suicide watch, just... Um, you know, some of the detox meds they have you on make you kind of a little bit wobbly, and so they just you're supposed to go with a tech outside to smoke. So you didn't have like an interventionist. No, I did not. I did not. But what's really interesting is is that right before I checked myself in, um, I had been watching a lot of intervention on TV. I have never seen it. <laughs> what's the What's the draw? There's a lot of drama. <laughs> A lot of drama. Um, I can remember watching it and, and thinking, oh my God, these poor people, you know. <laughs> As I, uh, you know, got a little closer to the end, there was, a, um, they did a lot of, of opiate addicts on these shows and I started to, to be able to identify. And what I saw from watching that show was that there, people were getting well. They, you could get well. I, I had the mentality that I'm never going to, not take something ever um so so you d you thought we'll just be substituting yes well i had substituted already and i thought that was the solution i was arrested for prescription forgery opiates i was on probation i had copied some they the, i went to an OBGYN. <laughs> And they gave me a prescription for something, and, and I went to my desk at work. Um, I was working at a law office in an attempt to, oh, maybe if I go back to work and not stay home with these kids, I'll be, I'll be okay. And um, I, I used clip art, and I like made this fake-looking prescription for some, some high-power painkillers, and I took it to the pharmacy downtown, and they filled it. And, uh, and, then, and then I got arrested. This wasn't the first time I had done this, but, but it, I had, uh, I just got bolder, you know, as my addiction grew stronger, I got bolder and I, just no fear. Um, you know, I needed what I needed. And I, I didn't really care what the consequences were as long as I got it for that day. And, and that's what happened. And then, um, then I eventually got arrested. It didn't happen overnight, but um, then I was on probation. And what did you swap? What? Uh, meant? That's what I was going to tell you. So I was on probation, um, and I had to go see this counselor, or I don't know what he was, down at the McLeod Center, and I could not pass a drug screen. 
You know, when you're on probation, you're supposed to have clean drug screens. I couldn't, you know, I, I knew I was in trouble, but I, there was no ever any interest in not using drugs. So I kept pissing dirty. And my probation officer told me one day, he was like, hey, you know, I know you're struggling. Um, I think you'd be a really good candidate for methadone. And I had never heard of it, didn't know what it was. And um, I was like, he told, it described to me what it was. And I said, sure, How I'll try it. How did he describe it? He said, it is an opiate. Uh, it is a safe uh, medication used for someone that is trying not to use painkillers, like street drugs or whatever. And that it is, uh, it would be a regular thing that I could do. Um, and, and I take that back. I had heard of it before. <laughs> Way back in the day, I had, I had a, I was a restaurant manager and I had a server and I used to steal shit out of their purses all the time. They would keep them in my office. Drugs. Drugs, yes. And um, there was one girl who, who had methadone and who knows what it was prescribed for, but it was in pill form. And I took it and it like almost took me out. And I loved it. So I guess that was like in the back really of my strong. mind. Really strong. <clears throat> so, I, I mean, I, at this point I knew that, that I had to... Um, I had to do something and I, I was trying to follow probation and he was like, look, if you can't get clean drug screens, you're going to be in really big trouble. And so I felt like that was the next thing. So I went in the first, my first day for my first dose and Ann Rick was there. <laughs> <laughs> and I can remember doing, going through the intake process and she gave me my first dose of methadone. And uh, she said, this is going to make you feel better. Um, because I was in withdrawal kind of by that point too. And she said, this is going to make you feel better. Um, and don't stay on it long. And um, I was on it for six years. Hmm. Increasing dosages. And methadone's synthetic. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't come from a poppy. Because there are some drugs, right, that... <clears throat> now they have as a kind of bridge, like I hear about Suboxone. Yes. Have you ever used Suboxone? Um, I believe that they used that on me for maybe two or three days in detox. But it um, wasn't a long-term no, kind of thing. No, no. And Suboxone, do people develop dependency yes. on? Yes. Oh, you can? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I was in treatment with several people who were abusing and dependent upon that. Yeah. It's, it's a chemical prison. Yeah. Because you're always dependent. Like I know people who they want to go on vacation and they're like, but I got to get my doses. Yes. Because if I don't take my doses with me, it's not going to be much of a vacation. No, it's not. Like no. you're always on a tether. Yes. And the tether is how much of this supply do I have? Yes. And one of the most interesting things about it is once you're there for, and you know, I don't want to, they have counselors there and I know they attempted to counsel me, mm -hmm. but I, I could not hear anything because all, all I used them for was my medication to get through the day. And I did fine on it for the first 90 days. Now, did fine on it means I lived up in the university area. I would have to wake up at like four o'clock in the morning and drive down to South uh, Clanton Road where McLeod Center used to be and wait in line to get a dose every morning. A lot of good conversation going on in that line. Yeah. <laughs> Did yeah. people speak? People speak, um, they're usually talking about how you can get more fucked up. Um, if you do this or go there. If you there do this or, or go there or, or trying to, you know, sell, you know, because what happened was after 90 days, all my drug screens were coming back clean. Miraculously, they were clean for everything but methadone, which is what I was supposed to be using. Um, and and it, the interesting thing about a methadone clinic is you go in the first day, they give you five milligrams. A few days later, they say, do you want to go up? Yes, please. Yes, please. 
is the answer to that. And then a few days later, would you like to go up again? Yes, please. So by the end, when I checked into Willingway, I was on 130 milligrams a day. Woof, that's a long way from five. Yeah, it's a long way from five. Now, something that also happened in the six years is I got pregnant. So um, uh, at that point, you know, with the weight gain and all of that, uh, I did not know that there existed a place that you could go and detox from it while pregnant. Um, but I found out later that there, there are places that would do that. And Willingway is one of them. Um, but so you were <clears throat> five in the morning pregnant standing in line. Yes. But after 90 days, if all your drug screens are clean, what they'll do is they'll give you what they call take home doses. Right. That's where my trouble began because if I have no solution, no, this is just a substitute. You know, I went from having to buy my pills off the internet or steal them from neighbors or, or forge prescriptions. Forge prescriptions to I have a steady supplier <clears throat> who is going to keep me on a regimented dose, on a daily dose where I have to go get it, but then they're going to trust me <laughs> to take home 13 bottles of methadone. That are that's supposed to last me for 13 days until I go back again, and usually what happened um, was by day about six or seven it was all gone because you take a little swig you get higher you take another little swig you get higher and it's so long acting I'm a drug addict you know I have no program of recovery no you know it, it's it's no different than me. Um, you know, getting a new bottle of pills and taking all of them in one day. It's, you know, nobody was watching me, nobody, you know, I was just alone with, with you know, what I knew made, would work for the day. But the trouble was that those last few days waiting to go back to the clinic to get my next dose and my next take home, I was in complete and full withdrawal and I did that cycle for a really long time. So my ex-husband got about six or seven good days every other, you know, every month. Really. I, I can't imagine, like this is the point at which most people go, heroin, yes please, you know, and then they go back and forth Sometimes yeah. they use them at the same time. same time. I mean, that's a prescription for, I'm going to go to hell every week or two. Yeah. You know? Yes. I'm either way up here or it's just abjectly miserable. Yes. And the abjectly miserable is complete isolation, complete darkness, a dark room, a TV. Um, you know, you're really sick. Just throwing up, it, it's miserable, chills, it feels like the worst flu. And then of course your mind is just, is just jonesing and you, you're think, trying to think of anything to take, but I learned pretty quickly that once you're addicted to methadone, the only thing that'll get you high is more methadone. There are some things you can add to it to, to increase the high, but um, they're really dangerous. Um, Xanax is one thing. Yeah, no, kind of that can flat, you can flatline. Yeah, yeah. I've, There's a lot <clears> of that. I should have died many, many times. Well, uh, all the benzos. Mm -hmm. Any benzo, yeah. I had some Xanax. I had a, stole some from somebody. And, and it, back in my pill-using days, I, that was a great combination for me, a Xanax and a pain pill. That, and like throw in a muscle relaxer and you're really good to go. That was one of my favorites, but that it came a little harder to find. So when I started on the methadone, they of course do counsel you on, look, you can't do this, this, and this. That's why you're drug tested regularly, blah, blah, blah. But obviously with no, no, no program of recovery, no, nobody keeping an eye on me, um, I would play around with that. And the, when I stopped doing that, was the morning that I woke up, I was on my front porch, I'd been smoking cigarettes, um, and I woke up and my nightgown was like burned almost all the way off. 
I was not burned for some reason. The way I was had passed out or whatever, but it was just a slow burn, I guess. Um, and that scared the shit out of me. I was like, okay, well, now I don't take a whole one next time. Just try half a one. So but also, <laughs> I mean, you could have set the house on fire. The kids could have gone yeah. up. So many different things could have happened. Yeah, my favorite thing to do, I would never sit down when I was on methadone. It was really interesting because, I don't know, you, you may have seen someone on methadone. The minute they sit down, they nod out. Right. So I, was, I knew that that would happen, so I stood up a lot. And I would fall over standing up, and we had to replace the dishwasher like three times because I would fall over into it, or I'd fall down the stairs, or... And my kids used to say that, oh, Mimi's sleeping like a horse again. So that was a normal, that was a somewhat normal thing. My legs would swell up really big because I would never sit down. A lot of people at the methadone clinic, they, they would drink with it. And I, I, did, I wouldn't do that. It's so interesting. It's so interesting what I would do and what I wouldn't do. But I, but I would not drink because alcohol with it. Because drinking and benzos, they're kind of similar. Kind of similar, that they... yeah. I just knew historically drinking for me, uh, I did things that I was really, really ashamed of when I was drinking. Becoming a wife and then later down the road becoming a mother, I was like, oh no, we're going to have to find something different because this is no good. Um, so it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. You're expected to be an adult. Yes, and I, and I enjoyed, I didn't like drinking by myself. If I was drinking, I wanted to be somewhere with people, and I would always get in trouble that way. But opiates, it, it just, for a long time, you know, you could, nobody would know. Nobody knew. Did you have an injury that started you using it? Um, no, I... Uh, as a child, I would get really, I had asthma, but I, I would get bronchitis pretty bad. Um, Cough. At, like in my teenage years, yeah. Like Tough where, breathing. Yeah. And I have not done the research to find out if this is true, but I'm pretty sure it was. I actually worked in a pharmacy when I was in high school. Now, I wasn't using then. I was, I was doing the, um, I, I was experimenting with alcohol. I um, got a really bad cough one time and pretty sure at some point in time for a small period of time if you just went to a pharmacist and said I, look I've got this terrible cough you could get like cough medicine with codeine without a prescription. I, I, I don't know if that's completely true but I don't remember going to a doctor and getting it but I remember taking it and I remember what I was wearing, what the room looked like and what I felt like the first time I ever took that. And um, what did it feel like? It felt like a warm blanket. It felt like um, it felt like Christmas time. It felt like uh, you know, snuggled up to a warm fire on Christmas morning um, by yourself uh, with a blanket on. That's what it felt like to me. Um, it was very I've cozy. come home. Yes, yes, I've come home. Like I felt comfortable. I felt not anxious. Um, I belong. I belong. Um, beautiful. Um, all of those things. Good enough. Good enough. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's almost like you're describing falling in love. Yeah, it was an absolute love affair. Now. Obviously, I was in my teens, so you know I, I didn't have a ready, a steady supply of opiates. But something switched in my brain that day, and although my alcohol use continued throughout college, any chance I could get to go to a doctor and be sick and get something, I would. I would save it for like weekends when my roommate was out of town, um, you know, because. I found pretty quickly that if you go to a doctor's office and you're coughing and you say you can't sleep, they are going to write you a prescription for some type of uh, narcotic cough medication. It reminds me, you and I have a mutual friend who she took like a heavy rock or something mm -hmm. and broke her foot yes. to yes. get a prescription. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
um, people who are not who do not experience substance use disorder, that sounds completely crazy. Crazy. Like, why would you break your bones? Mm -hmm. That and it's like because that's what you do. Because I have to have this. Because yes. I have no other strategy other than to break my bones mm -hmm. to get them to give this to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's people can't understand that they can't no no it's it's a that's a tricky one that i i did not ever break a bone but i threw myself down the stairs and bruised myself up a little bit to go to the er um and and back then so this is like the 90s and the early 2000s before these pharmacies had this way to keep track of what people were doing, um, regulations and all of that. And, um, I lived in Florida for, a, for about four years and Florida, they had like the walk-in clinics on every corner and you, I had this one place where I'd go and I'd give him $40 and he'd say, what do you want? And, and I could get whatever I wanted. And he, you know, I had to space it out and I had different places that I'd go. Once a month weekend, like when my husband went out of town and I just wanted to be cozy and watch movies by myself all weekend, you know, I'd do that, but then. That's the way some people get wine, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Some, some people get, you know, just big bottles of wine yeah. and check out. You yeah, know? yeah. And, uh, and, I sometimes wish that mine had been alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly a lot more straightforward. I just could not behave myself when I was drinking. Yeah. At all. It, every time something tragic would happen. Yeah. Yeah. What led to you agreeing with your yeah. husband to go to treatment? A few, uh, about a month prior, he had finally gotten brave enough to ask me about it. Um, you know, with my take-home doses, I would have to keep them in a lockbox. Um, and it was this big ritual every day of climbing up in the top of the kitchen cabinet, getting down my lockbox, taking my dose, or, you know, going back up there to get a little bit more of another dose. And I can't remember exactly how he became aware or he, I think he, he had just lived with it for so long and it was just what he had decided that he was going to live with, but I, he had just had enough. And so he asked me about it and he was like, Amy, are you, are you taking, you know, are you taking more than what you're supposed to? And, and I am pretty sure that I admitted that I was. So we came up with this great plan that he was going to keep the key to the lockbox. And he was going to give me my dose for the day to keep me from. And we had talked a little bit about, about get me getting off of it. But once he did that, I, my body couldn't handle. Like, it was like I was used to doing what I was used to doing. And I was used to taking as much as I was used to taking. And he giving me some little tiny bit of a dose is not going to even come close to what I was used to doing. So... Towards the end, he, he went, to, we had started the conversation, but he went to work one day, he worked at the bank and, and I, um, I called him and, uh, told him that I was done. I couldn't live like this anymore and that I was about to kill myself and he needed to come home. Now, I don't remember having like a major plan except for I knew the kids were at school. Um, and I could do the van in the garage with a you know, just whatever. I'd seen enough TV. I'd been watching lots of TV, so I knew how to do it. But he came home, and, and we began to have a conversation, and, and, and that's when we started looking into treatment centers, and that's when we started. Um, and, and it's funny. I, if I had gone to that place in Virginia, they would have put me on Suboxone. Um, Wheeling Way is one of the only treatment centers in the south in the whole the East that, that will take a high dose methadone patient. So we're special. We get super angry. <laughs> um, yeah, I was in detox for, for 15 days. Back to your question, we kind of decided together. And then there was a, he had to take a kid to a baseball game or something. And I 
broke into the lockbox because you don't go to treatment. It's over. Uh, that is stupid. Um, and so I broke into the lockbox, but it was hard to break into. And I remember I had, I had got a, out a big butcher knife and I was jabbing at the box. And I remember sending him a text. If you don't tell me where the fucking key is, you're done. You know, something like that. Like threat. He's at a baseball game with my children. He's got all, all three at a baseball game and I'm threatening him via text message that if he doesn't give me the key to where my drugs are, um, it's not going to be a pretty picture when he gets home. And he didn't say, you promise, you promise we're done. <laughs> yeah. No, gosh. You know, he had tried um, a, a few years prior. Um, before I got on methadone, he had kicked me out and I went and got an apartment, gave me some money. I went and got an apartment and I just basically stayed over there and got fucked up for about a month and then worked my way back into the home because I didn't have a job. <laughs> I did not believe that I could ever be free of the prison that I was in. And I had just lived the cycle for so long and I was so tired of it. It's exhausting. It's depressing. I can't imagine living under the same roof with someone who was like me um, or being a child of someone who was like me because it was, I was present for six days and then I wasn't until it's time to go back to the clinic, you know? So we, we came to the decision that, that we were going to go and we drove to Virginia next day, called, well, called my mom that night and she reminded him about Willing Way. And then I checked in there the next day and I went there willingly and, and, um, I can remember, you know, the check-in process as they were like going through my stuff. I had brought opiate addicts eat a lot of candy, like lots of candy. <laughs> um, that was one of the things I had to do when I got sober was clean up the wreckage of my mouth um, and have a lot of dental work. But, um, you know, I had brought like cases of airheads, um, suckers and caramels. And, and that's what I had been living on. I had been living on that and like ice cream. Um, and, um, and the check-in process, something switched in me. It was almost as if I knew that that ride down here where I'm fucked up and I'm sleeping and I'm chill and everybody loves me is getting ready to be over. <laughs> and, um, they started the, the intake process and I just started losing my mind and I cussed out everybody that looked at me. Um, I remember looking at at him at one point and he he was just like standing in the corner with his eyes like this like oh my god and um and then he left me there which is one of the now at that point could you have said i'm not doing it he wouldn't have let me come home he he would have he would have left me there he would have yeah i could have but at this point I, I knew I couldn't live the way I was living anymore. I, I, had, I had done that. I had endured that life for a really long time. And it was getting to the point where I, I had a little tiny bit of hope that there could be something different, but I had no idea what they were going to ask me to do. And, you know, it started with the, you can't have, we're gonna take your candy. And no, you can't bring these books in here. Um, here's you a big blue book and here's you a little thin book and here's your room and you need to be ready to go about seven o'clock because we're, we're going to go to a meeting. 12 step meeting. <laughs> yeah. 12 step meeting. And I cussed all of them out. You fuck off. You fuck, you know, it was just awful. Called them names. And I said, I'm I sure they going. never heard never that. Heard that. <laughs> I said, I am not unique. doing that. I'm not doing that. And, and you know, what they do there, I, and I certainly, I'm not a doctor. I don't know the, the medical term for it, but they pretty much just tranquilize you so you can't run for a few days. <laughs> but they still, it's, it, but it's not a tranquilizer of what your body is used to. So it's like you're just slow. 
you're slow, but you feel like complete shit. Brown day two, you know, he, I remember looking out and out the window when he left and, you know, he had his head bent over the steering wheel and he was, I mean, he started crying in there and I was like, what the fuck are you crying about? You don't have to fucking stay here, you know, and it's just so selfish. It's just so self-centered. Thank God he left me there and he made it very clear throughout my first few days that nobody was coming to get me. And if I wanted to leave, I could leave and figure it out. But he was not going to provide me any money. I could not see the children again. Um, and I was on my own. So I did the dance of packing my bags like three days in a row. And that got pretty exhausting. <laughs> I went and sat on the curb a couple of times. I'm leaving. Fuck all of y'all. Was there um, in treatment after a couple of weeks, Mm -hmm. Was there like a shift? Yeah. What, what happened? So I, you know, I was in the detox ward for a lot of days. Um, it was like a circle. So there's a circle of rooms and there was a nurse's station right in the middle. And so there's about six people on the detox wing at the same time. And most people cycled in three or four days and they moved on to the next place where I'd see them like at group and stuff like that. And, and I kept going, what the fuck? Why, why can't I go over there? And I was smoking in my room. I was, you name it. I, I like got the whole detox unit to walk outside with me one day because I wanted to smoke. And I was like, they, we can't go. They said those motherfuckers said we can't go unless we all go. So come on, we're going. So I was just really acting out. I wouldn't eat. Um, and You're organizing a I'm walkout. I'm organizing a walkout. <laughs> like, basically... The smoke out. Yeah. The sm yeah. It's a we're political going to smoke. act. Fuck we're these people. We're going to smoke together. Yeah. <laughs> Just ridiculous. I threw my shit all around my room one day. Um, not literally your shit. <laughs> no, not literally my shit, but my there stuff. There are those people. Like, my, my clothes, my whatever else I brought. Um just made a giant mess and, and one of the nurses heard the ruckus and she walked in and she said, hey, you need to clean that up. And then she turned around and walked out. I'm like, fuck you. And, um, and, and the, there were people there, the counselor there. There were a couple of people that when I would get upset or pissed, they would say, hey, Amy, come on, let's go for a walk. And they'd walk with me while I ranted and raved. There were a couple of people that would just stop in their tracks and look me dead in the eyes and go, stop, you need to stop. And then, and then I heard, so there was a guy, he, I was smoking in my room and he looked at me one day and he said, hey, and I thought nobody knew. <laughs> he said, hey, you need to quit smoking in your room. And I started to, to fight back and he was like, if you quit smoking in your room, you can move over to the, the, the other unit. And I, and I didn't know that by that point in time, the, the methadone had been taken out of my body. Like I had been detoxed. Um, I still felt like my skin was crawling. I, my, my eyelashes hurt. I could not sleep at all. Um, I couldn't eat. Um, I, you know, they were giving me stuff to keep me from throwing up. So like I wanted to throw up, but I couldn't even throw up. Um, but I was going out of that nurse's station like every hour going, I got a headache or I got this or I got that because that's how I'd lived my life for so long was you got any kind of ailment, you, there's a pill for it. And, and one of the nurses finally said, hey, quit coming up here. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not going to get anything. You need to go to group or you need to go to the lecture or whatever. And so the guy that told me to quit, that he knew I was smoking in my room and if I would stop, then I could move on to the next level. I got down there and I was unpacking my stuff in my room and, and I could go out and smoke whenever I wanted to. That was the kicker. Because they were like, look, if you get over to the next unit, you can go outside and smoke whenever you want to. You don't have to have anybody with you. So that was like, <laughs> like a carrot, you know, and I'm going towards the carrot, which is I can fucking have some freedom. Like I ain't got to be up in here with these yahoos anymore, you know, and I'm one of the yahoos. 
Um, and, and then when I got over there, um, one of the counselors came up and he said, Amy, I'm going to tell you something right now. You're about this close from your husband saying you have to do the, the year-long program. If you straighten up and start following the rules and start doing what we're asking you to do, that, that'll come off the table. But you're about this close. And I was like, I don't fucking want to stay here for a year. I didn't know how long I was going to stay, but I certainly didn't want to stay for a year. Um, so, so I was just, I, I, at that point, I, there was like a switch, um, a switch of, you know, cause you go from talking a bunch of shit with all the other people in there to, Hey, did you, did you do that assignment? They told us we fucking have to do, you know, it's just like a, a little slow progression. I was just doing what addicts and alcoholics do. I'm rubbing against authority. I didn't buy in. I, I wasn't going to hold your hand while we prayed. I don't believe in God. Um, this is re repetitious. This is annoying. Um, it's a cult. It's a cult. <laughs> it's not going to work. I still feel like shit, but I was doing it. You know, I, I would, I, I got up, I would make up my bed. I would, one day I opened the blinds and I hadn't opened the blinds in years. One day I felt like eating breakfast. Then I started being on time for group or, um, you, you know, getting in the van to go to the meetings, you know, talking shit with everybody outside the meetings. That became entertaining to me somewhat. And, 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 and I just, you know, it was kind of like my body was just moving, but my head wasn't with me. Like I didn't, I didn't believe, I had no belief, but I was still going through the motions of what would eventually save my life. And did they hold you accountable? Did they say, who's your sponsor? Like, let so us know. One of the coolest things was my counselor, my individual counselor, the one that did all my individual sessions with me while I was there, she was a methadone addict in recovery. I think she had been a stripper at some point. Anyway, she was... Um, Great she, stories. <laughs> yes, yes. And she told me that I could call her until I got a sponsor. She said, but you can only call me for 10 days. So I had to hurry up and get a sponsor, you know. How'd you do that? Um, <laughs> I went to a lot of meetings and I sat there and I listened. And You auditioned? Attempted. Did you interview? No, no. I sat there and believed that I would never, that I was never going to get a sponsor. I don't want a sponsor. These women are a bunch of alcoholics. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I'm different. You know, what we do. And then until I heard this woman one day talk about how she um, threw a bottle of Vicodin up on the, in the rafters of her house to hide it from herself. And I said, that's who I want. That's, that's who I got to find. And then I had to find her. Then I had to go like to a bunch of different meetings to find her. But the treatment center, they, they gave me a good discharge plan. And, and at that point, you know, I had had six weeks. And that was six weeks that I had never had since I was probably 16 years old, 16, 17 years old, where I did not take a pill. I did not uh, drink a sip of alcohol. Um, and I had never, I had not been, I was like 39 years old when I went to treatment. So it had been a long time since I had been completely free of substances. So I was in a little bit of better headspace to hear, if you don't do these things, when you walk out the door, you're going you're gonna to end up back in here. And I didn't want to do that. You kept referring to a, you don't have a program of recovery. There's such a huge, whether you want to call it psychological or spiritual component to substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just huge. Um, there's a reason that substance use disorder is in the DSM. Mm -hmm. Like you can't do an MRI <laughs> or a blood pressure right. screen or take somebody's blood work right. and say, here's an addict, here's not an addict. Yeah. So talk to me about that. What, what, for Amy, what did recovery look like? So for me, um, I, I was able to identify some things that would 
send me into a relapse. One was going to doctor's offices because I had done that for so, so long, um, going to doctor's office. So, so they provided me with a letter. Like anytime I would legitimately need to go to a doctor, I had a letter that I would, took with me that basically said, red flag, red flag, red flag, don't give this girl anything. I also was drug screened for about two years, randomly drug screened, uh, because I cannot be trusted. I can tell you I'm not using, but I can also look like I'm not using. Um, I was engaged in some type of treatment for, uh, I did six weeks and I did about six months and then I did about a year and a half of, I did Willing Way, Dilworth Center, and then um, Tammy Bell's Relapse Prevention Program for a year and a half. So I had eyes on me. I had other people keeping it. You had people eye. call bullshit. Yes, yes. I could say, Look at me, I'm so much yes, better. Yes. And you're like, eh, yeah. not so yes, much. Yes, yes. And I, I can't speak to alcoholic drinking. And I, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I still view it as a little bit different. Opiate addicts, we are, we, it's a little bit, it's, we're a little bit, just a little bit shadier. <laughs> and so the, the more people I had, like on my recovery team for me, the better. Um, and then, of course, the 12 step recovery and, and sponsorship and working through the 12 steps. Accountability. 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 And something to do, you know. Um, I was a stay at home mom for the last 10 years of my using. You know, I pretty much didn't have to ever get dressed. You know, the kids would fix their own lunch in the morning, they'd walk themselves up to the bus stop when they were like five and six. You know, so I, I really didn't have much responsibility. Coming into, you know, getting out and knowing that I had to take action, do things and drive places and be somewhere, you know, that, that was accountability too. But I tried to shortcut it. I tried to, they told me to go to 90 meetings in 90 days and I, I tried to do three meetings a day for 30 days. I eventually saw a difference. Um, people were really happy to see me and people hadn't been happy to see me in a long time. I didn't have any people really, except for the ones that I lived with, and they were about sick of my shit, you know. So, when did you start to like not just feel like I'm not throwing up or whatever, yeah. or I'm not screaming at people, yeah, but oh wow, I could, I could have a life. I was cooking for my kids. We cooked the same shit every day. It feels like I hated feeding them. It was such a chore. I never got any joy out of, you know, preparing a meal for my children. It was really just to get it over with so that I could move on with the day, which, you know. And when you got little kids, they got to eat. And one night I was cooking them, cooking them the same thing I cooked for them every night, just about. And that was frozen chicken nuggets, macaroni and cheese. And, um, and I remember uh, calling them down for dinner, and m my thought was, I'm excited to see them when they come down. And from the time they were born until that moment, I had not had like a really positive thought about any of my motherhood duties. Like... I would watch TV and I would watch movies and I would watch these doting mothers and, you know, they make sure they don't have to walk home in the rain. They'll meet them at the bus stop or they'll, you know, I, I just didn't remember having a positive thought about a, a um, mundane motherly task. And um, I don't even remember how, how, Far along I was but I remember that thought changing and it wasn't I want to fucking hurry up and get this shit done so they'll leave me to fuck alone it was oh my god they're all going to come down they're all going to sit here and I'm going to ask them about their days and look at their faces and, and that was a shift because I didn't think that that kind of normalcy was possible for my brain so, that's that. 
That's been how many years clean and so? Um, uh, nine years. Hopefully it'll be 10 in uh, February. Congratulations. Thank you. And in that nine years, a lot has happened. A lot has happened. A lot has happened. Lots of beautiful things and lots of things that I believe that um, God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. Um, and uh, yeah, big changes. Yeah. And your kids have gotten older. Yeah. Yeah, they were nine, eight, and four whenever I checked into treatment. And they are now uh, 19, 18, and 14. So now tell me, how's your health? My how's, health. <laughs> how's your legal slash employment history? And, <laughs> and how are your relationships? Okay. My health is, is uh, much better. I actually, um, I take good care of myself. I've started running the past three or four years. Um, and uh, I feel good. Um, I'm eating a little healthier. Well, a lot healthier. The sweet, thank, thank God for me, the, uh, once I quit the opiates, the sugar cravings went down. I know for alcohol, and I am an alcoholic, but... For people that are drinking, I know their sugar desires increase when they stop drinking, and and that that wasn't um, the case for me. So, um, but healthier lifestyle um, for sure. Uh, legal, um, I. Are you a convicted felon? No, no. No, when I got sober, I uh, went through the steps to get that. Uh, taken care of, um, expunged from my record. I, I ended up going to a, a place where I actually work today and I asked them if they had any part-time work. And um, they initially told me, no, we don't, but we'll let you know if we do. And uh, then they called me back a while ago and it was the place that I was getting drug screened. Hmm. <laughs> um, so you got so experience. I went in, so I went in for a drug screen and um and an interview on the same day and uh they hired me they took a chance and um they knew what they wanted me to be but i didn't know what i wanted to be i just kind of thought i was going to work in the shadows and file some things and um they saw something in me that i that i didn't see in myself and 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 i started working on the phones and now you see little Amy's. Yes, all the now time. I do. I talk to them on the phone. I see them in person. My favorite people to talk to are the angry ones. <laughs> um, but so sometimes I have to put on my. I was raised by a family with the disease of alcoholism hat. Sometimes, sometimes I have to put on my. I'm an opiate addict hat. Sometimes I have to put on my. My husband was about to leave me hat. It just, it just all really depends on, on who I'm talking to. But um, my, I've heard, um, uh, I have been told that my message is direct and clear. Um, and, I, and I won't bullshit with somebody. I ask the questions that others might be afraid to ask. Like? Well, you know, if someone calls and says they you know, been using opiates for 15 years and they haven't used in three weeks. I'm like, bullshit. Are you in a, like lockdown in your room? What are you doing? Or, I, or I'll just, I'll just dig a little deeper and find out. And usually in that case, they're, they're drinking alcohol or something like that. You know, generally folks that, that call us are, they want help. And, and most people that call treatment centers do but I love the ones that call and say somebody else told them they needed to call and then they tell me everything and then they say well what do you think do you think I have a problem and and my one of my favorite responses is well people who don't think they problem have a don't think they have a problem would never call a treatment center and they're like oh you're right you're right I am uh, remarried and I have two stepchildren and um, in May, we will have been married for two years. Congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. And yeah. the thing is, is that when you're on the front lines like you are, you mm -hmm. see the tragedies, mm -hmm. but you also see the miracles. Yeah. Yeah. 
and the price you pay for for the miracles is you yeah. are going to see the tragedies. Sure. But sometimes the miracles are so much smaller than even someone, you know, j getting all the way sober. Sometimes the miracle is just that they they picked up the phone to have a conversation with somebody. You know, I think about all the times that that I um, was just so sick and miserable and, and, and just felt so completely alone. I did not know that there were places out there that I could call. I did not know because in my family, I was raised in an environment where, you know, if somebody doesn't have a pill, then somebody down the street does, you know? And, and so I, the people that I was going to for help, it always looked like, well, let us come and help you with the kids or let us come and um, watch the kids while you get some sleep. Or, um, you know, I just didn't know that, that one of the possibilities could be that I could be completely free of all chemicals that killed my spirit, you know? I, I didn't know that. So, you know, that's one of the things that I always try to be really encouraging with folks on the phone and people who show up there are, you know, it, it takes a lot of balls to fucking ask for help. To just say, hey, I've been doing this, this, and this. What do you think? And saying, I think we can help you, you know? There isn't a whole other way to live. Um, and, and I love to think that, that lots of times what, we, what I do is, um, it, it's, it's plant the seed, you know, they, they can't un, once you've called a place like where I work and you talk to somebody who cares and has compassion and has the ability to not, um, not allow you to bullshit too much, you know, sometimes we got to listen to it a little bit, but then, you know, that's a seed that's planted that they, Maybe the next time they're feeling that way, they might call again. Hey, she was nice to me. She was kind. She didn't judge me. Didn't lecture. Yeah. 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 If we get struck by lightning today and the only thing that survives is this little piece of audio, what is Amy's legacy? that it doesn't matter what kind of family you're raised in. It doesn't matter um, how sick your parents are. Um, it doesn't matter that all of the branches in your family tree are broken. Um, that if you are willing, um, that recovery is possible, um, no matter what you're up against. Um, if I can get sober, anybody can. That's very hopeful. Yeah. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you. I should say I know Amy's ex. I know her current husband. I've met her kids, her stepkids. And I just love these people so much. Um, next week, we talk to a buddy of mine who's an ex-hippie. Well, still probably a hippie proud hippie who is in the boomer generation in her 70s now in my hometown of Albany, Georgia. It's a really fun and wide-ranging conversation. I hope you'll join us next week with my friend Nancy Jones. Man Listening is a production of Unmediated LLC in cooperation with the Queen City Podcast Network and Balto Creative Media. Allison Andrews at Andrews Creative and Rachel Clapp Miller are developmental producers. Sally Higgins at Higgins and Owens tries to keep us legal. Our music is A Day at the Park by the group Pictures of the Floating World. Your announcer is Catherine Smith. That's me. Please go to our Patreon page. You'll find us at patreon.com. Look for man listening. One word, no spaces. We hope you'll join us by becoming a member. A small investment can raise up the conversation. If you want exclusive member merch, like a t-shirt, we can arrange that too. A huge shout out and thank you to everyone who has supported Man Listening from the very beginning. Thank you so much. Don't forget to support us at Patreon. We believe one voice can change the conversation. Click the subscribe button and next week you'll hear...
if you wanted to live on the farm, you would have to figure out a way to navigate an incredible amount of obstacles. It's hard to make money there. You know, you'd have to figure out how to support yourself. That's the hardest part. That's next week on Man Listening.